I want to thank you for being here for this lesson upon the first day of the week. I began to, or, we, or was given a thought a few days ago, who is this Jesus to you? So often we we look and we see this word and we this this name and, and we wonder or we don't wonder we don't think about it we read the word and it's simply Jesus. But see, there's something more to it than just that name. In Isaiah nine verse six, it says, "For to us a child is born." To us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There's there's a, a there's four names that are given right there, and we we think about that. These are the names that he's talking about that will belong to this one called Jesus. And throughout the Bible, we have been given many names and titles. But what is in a name anyway? We think about that. What's in a name anyway? It seems to be a simple question. Who is this Jesus? It's a question that will have many responses according to one's point of view or where they're standing that day. It's a question each of us need to ask ourselves, who is this Jesus to me? One might compare the thought uh, to a well-cut diamond. There are many facets, each one seemingly perfect, each one with its own beauty. And, and as you watch these who uh, cut these diamonds, they, they observe the beauty of each one of those facets, the, the, the color that comes through. And although each one by itself has a beauty, it's the whole that we can see the glory and the total worth of that stone. I want us to consider this morning the perfect facets of Jesus, looking to see as much of the whole as we can, to see who he is, to see the beauty in which he came, and, and what it should mean to each of us. It's impossible to see all that makes each facet, and yet I want us to see the glory in the whole of this short time. There are so many, there's so many faces of Jesus. And so often we just say Jesus and we don't think about what's happening in that particular episode. Is he serving as a comforter? Is he serving as a protector? Is he serving as a judge? What is he doing? What is he doing? See, he has many faces. In the opening of the New Testament, in Matthew 121, it, it says, She, that is Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. We come to this point, all of a sudden we see that this one who, who is Jesus, this Jesus is a common name. In most languages today, possibly in this country more than most. But as we look at this, we hear this word Jesus. And, and at the time Jesus was born, there seemed not to be anything great special about the name Jesus. Jedi says, this one, this one you shall name Jesus, and he shall save his people. The word would have been Yeshua, this Jesus, Yeshua. In Hebrew language meaning salvation. He said he will save his people. Jesus is our salvation. And we read on in Matthew, he continues to give more information from Isaiah in Matthew 1 23. He says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And we understand that the thing says God with us. Emmanuel means God. I mean, Emmanuel means with us. This, this prefix. And then we get to this L. E L. 
It means God, meaning God with us. John says it this way. And we fail to recognize that, that John gives us this message in great length. He begins to tell us who this Jesus is. He says, in the beginning was the word, that's God. And the word, well, wrong, I said that wrong. He said, in the beginning was the word. And this is a reference to Jesus and it makes this circle. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There's so much that he gives us here. John calls Jesus the Word. We'll get to that part in a moment. It's often that the Word is referred to as life, truth. And like or that which exposes all sin. Any one of those, those ideas would expose all sin. It becomes a guide to that one who is willing to follow. To that one who is willing to give himself over to God. He is a guide. He, who is, he, he also says something that is so difficult for us to grasp. He says that as he starts, the word was with God. Jesus was with God. And then he says the word. Was God. Jesus is God. Jesus was deity. It's such a difficult thing for us to grasp. We have to take what he says. That's true. And then he says God. Or that he was with God in the beginning. Well, he was with God in the beginning. The world, the word is Jesus, and we see that he has, or see that he is eternal. That's God. I want us to go down or to connect. Or let's look at first Luke 1, 30 first. I want us to see something there more. Luke 1. 30 and 33. It says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. He's talking to Mary. And you will call his name Jesus. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob and his kingdom. There will be no end. Those two verses tell us that this, this Jesus is eternal, this Christ, this one called Emmanuel. In 14 of John 1, he says, and the word became flesh, this word this word that was in the beginning, this word that was with God, this word that was God, this word that was in the beginning with God, and this word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory as the only Son from the Father full of grace and truth. John gives us a tremendous amount of thought on who this Jesus was. It's difficult for us to get a hold of that. He said he was the son from the Father. The son of God. Important that we see this idea. And it is likely that is where most see him. In Jesus, the son of God. We, we see the importance of this title. It's very important that we catch this title. Jesus, the son of God. In Matthew 16, Matthew 16, 13 through 18, he said, when, uh, when Jesus came to the distant 
district of Caesarea Philippi, asked his disciples, Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son of God. A very important phrase. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood can, has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. On what rock? On the rock that he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We have to remember that it is through Christ only. I must believe that Jesus is the Son of God before I can accept him as a sacrifice for sin and accept the forgiveness that he's willing to give. Him being the Son of God is where I can come to him and find him and him become my Savior. He said, you're Christ, the Son of the living God. This is what he's going to build his church on. This is what he's built his church on. Peter brings out another title. The Messiah. The Anointed One. The Chosen One. Jesus says of himself. This idea of the Chosen One. In Luke 4 verse 18 through 19 he says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon me. This is Christ speaking. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind and to set liberty to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He doesn't say directly that he is the Messiah. You see, when he says Christ, when Peter calls him the Christ, he says he is the Messiah. And when he comes here, the chosen one is, is what Messiah means. And when we come down here, we hear Christ say, He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. He sent me. God sent me. God chose me. He said, I am the chosen. I am the anointed one. So it adds another layer to this idea. He said, I was chosen by God for a purpose to come and give myself as a sacrifice for sin. And through that, bring others to him. He had a purpose. He was one who was given to do all that God asked of him. And then Matthew 16, 16. We want to hear, hear this. He said, you're Christ, son of the living God. Son of the living God. The wise men, when they came seeking Jesus, this one they see as the living or the son of the living God, the son of God. The wise men came saying, where is he who is born king of the Jews? They asked this of Herod. They sought him. They sought to know where he was. They sought to find this one. They sought him as their king. I said, well, that's just a phraseology of what it may be. But they were, they were majestic men in themselves and they saw him as king. As one who would be king of the Jews. I want us to go to John the 19th chapter. I want us to see as Christ hung on that cross. John 19 verse 19 through 22.
I want us to go back to 17. He says, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull. This is Christ. Which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him with two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. And Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, I have written what I have written. You see, this, this one who was Jesus was king. He was king of the Jews. He was king of man. He was that one who had the ultimate power over all. Pilate may not have known the significance of his writing. It was saying that this one is in rule. This one who defeats the world or sin. This one who was there on that cross and defeated Satan. It's in this one who will all or who is all powerful. He is king. He is king. And so this Jesus is our king. He rules our kingdom. In John 2 verse 26 through 28. He said eight days later. His disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them. And he said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But he issues the statement, My Lord and my God. It was not an expression, as many believe, of surprise or profanity, but one of utter joy, one of total confession, a confession of deity of this one called Jesus. Thomas realized what John had written in John 1, the word was God, the word used for God in this reference to Lord Jesus is Theos. It is used to refer to the Lord Jesus as the true God. I want us to look at the names that come after the death of Jesus. As a preface, I want us to go over to Matthew 1 once again. Matthew 1, verse 46 and 47. Let's uh, go to Luke. In Luke 1, 46 and 47, Mary has, has realized a little more about who this is that she is carrying. And we see her as she has visited Mary or Elizabeth. And she begins to sing a song of praise. And she says in 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And I want us to think just a minute because she saw something here that we miss. The word Theos is used here in reference to the Lord Jesus. The word Savior is Soter. Meaning one who delivered from danger and death. And it would be very descriptive of Jesus giving his life blood so that man 
could have forgiveness of sin, this having life. But she says, my Lord, or uses the word God, God my Savior, Theos, again, this one that is the true God and Savior, this Jesus. In 1 John 2, 1, he said, my little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I want us to think about that. He is already our Savior. He is that one who is our sacrifice for sin. He is our Savior, that one who gives us forgiveness. But now he's our advocate. We follow Christ. We've given ourselves over. And yet if we fail or we fall into sin. It says he is our advocate. He's our goal between a lawyer before a judge. He has paid the price for our sin. It is his blood which covers that sin from God. But he is also speaking in our behalf of our purity that is through him. Hebrews 4, Hebrews the fourth chapter, in verse 14, or starting at verse 14, he said, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one in who every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin, let us then with confidence draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He says a lot here as high priest. That on who was chosen. He set apart to be offered as a sacrifice. The, the high priest Perform the sacrifice. But as Christ is the high priest. He gave himself as that sacrifice which is continual. Jesus becoming that sacrifice. But the priest is also known as that go between. Or that advocate making intercession for man. That one who, who, who gives himself to care for those children of God. You see, the blood not only covered our sin and gave us or brought us the forgiveness of sin and salvation. That we might come to God, but the blood that continues to cover that sin. The high priest, that one who is merciful and compassionate, knowing our struggles and our temptations. We can come to him seeking help or seeking help through him. That we might be able to walk as we should walk and, and, and give ourselves as we should give ourselves. In Colossians, the third chapter, he says something that we need to look. He said, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, Slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Maybe we miss that phrase. Christ is all. To have Christ is to have all things. And all his servants as himself, all things to them, Christ is. There's nothing more. Christ is it's the idea that in him is fullness, completeness. He gives everything that we need to follow him and to continue in him, living our life for God. He gives us those things. In him we have been given a savior. We've been given a purpose. His word is direction. 
We have been given freedom. We have a culture. Think about that, a culture. A culture as a Christian. We have a home. We have a life. We have life. True life. We have hope. There's a purpose there. A kingdom. A friend. A teacher. A protector. A comforter. A father. A high priest. A mighty king. God. We have all those things. This is who Christ is to us. All of these things. We read that that word Jesus. We need to be able to take that word Jesus and, and think about all that Jesus is. That's who he is to me. There is a completeness. There's a wholeness. And he gives all to me. He gives all to me. It's difficult for us to get a hold of this idea that this one who is Jesus is everything. And yet he tells us over and over and over that he is all. He's all. In John the 8th chapter, verse 12, Jesus tells us who he is. It's in a nutshell, and so it's hard for us to get a hold of. He said that Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. In me is truth. In me is life. In me is everything that is necessary for you. I am the world. That word would have been translated logos, which continues to carry the word life. He said, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. God is our everything. He's our all. I began to think of the, the songs that we sing that express this Jesus as our master, this Jesus as our Lord, this Jesus as our Savior, this Jesus as all of these things. And this idea of him being the Messiah. The song my wife and I learned many years ago. That maybe gives more to this name than any I sung. The name of it is Hero of Calvary. He said, why should I not love Jesus? Jesus who died for me. Why should I not adore him? Hero of Calvary. Why should I not love Jesus? Lost and alone was I. In his great love he saved me. Lifted my soul on high. Why should I not love Jesus? One day he'll come for me. Oh, I shall share his glory for all eternity. Seated in glory, I see him now. Highest archangels before him bow. Earthward he came, bearing my shame. Ever I love his name. Do we love this one called Jesus? This one who gave his life for us. But this one who will take us into eternity. This one who will comfort us in our difficulties, in our trials in life. This one who offers mercy and forgiveness when we fail. This one in whom we go to and we pray through him to God. This one who is our advocate of when we go before our God. He says, this one is mine. My blood is covered. The sins he had in life. 
this one is mine. This one will be one I bring to heaven with me. So many things that this name Jesus should bring to our mind. There's so many things that we should dwell on as we hear this name that we should be willing to praise it, that we should be willing to give our total love to him, that we should remember his name each day and seek to be in his presence. I want us to think about who this Jesus is. I hope that we can find comfort. I hope that we can find encouragement in understanding some of what Jesus is. Sometimes it's very difficult. But these things that are written, he says, we accept in faith. Knowing this is who he is. And knowing that his love has been given to its full extent. Why should we not love that name? Why should we not praise him? Why should we not give him his total duty? And remember that it is he who loves us. It is God who gave him to us as the one who was chosen. And he seeks us to follow him each day. I hope there's some encouragement here. I hope that you are able to look at these things and, and see more about this one who is Jesus. And what his name should mean to us. I want to thank you for being here today, and may God bless.